I want to do everything that I can today to dispel the idea, if it may exist in any of our minds, to get rid of the idea that there is a God to be feared in the Old Testament and that there's a God to be loved in the New Testament and therefore the fear of God has nothing to do with a Christian believer. Welcome to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith. And Colin, I think many people would think that the God of the Old Testament who was to be feared, but it's the God of the New Testament who is to be loved. But it sounds like you're saying that there is still a God to be feared for the Christian believer today. Well, the starting point is that God himself never changes. He is always to be feared and he is always to be loved. And, uh, you know, when I was a student, one of the most memorable experiences for me was reading the entire book of Deuteronomy in one sitting Hmm. and being completely and utterly overwhelmed by a sense of the love of God in the Old Testament. In fact, Deuteronomy, no less. Deuteronomy, yeah, absolutely. And, And then you come to the New Testament and then you find Jesus saying, fear him who is able to cast body and soul into hell, destroy them in hell. We have the command, fear God, is a New Testament command. In the first uh, letter uh, of Peter, you have Ananias and Sapphira lying to the apostles and and to God and finding themselves being struck down dead in the New Testament. So God never changes. And our love of him is to lead us to fear him. And our fear of him is to lead us to love him. And these things are never to be divided. We're going to see today how they are held together. Let's take a look at how they're held together. Join us if you can as we begin our message, The Fear of God. Here's Colin. We're continuing our series on the subject of the soul. You have a soul, it will last forever. Your soul will either be forever saved or else it will be forever lost, and therefore to care for your soul is of supreme importance. And we've been saying that God in his kindness has given us four friends to help you care for your soul. And we've been thinking about the Son of God, the Word of God, today the fear of God, and next week the love of God. All of these are spoken of in the Bible as being in the soul or in the life of a believer. And we began thinking about the Son of God. What an amazing gift this is. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The Son of God lives in the soul of a Christian believer. What kind of gift is that? Uh, This amazing gift of the Son of God as the first friend of your soul putting you in a position where you're able to pursue a new and a different life because new and different desires are arising from the presence of Christ with you and in you. And then last week we looked at the Word of God, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. The Word of God producing good fruit in the life of a believer, working from the inside out as it takes root within your soul. Now, today we come to the third friend, the fear of God. Now, my first task, and I don't think it's an easy one today, is to make the case that the fear of God is actually a friend. Some of you may, as a first um, thought, uh, be thinking, what, the fear of God? That sounds more like an enemy to me than a friend. Isn't that what we're trying to get away from? Isn't that what we're trying to get rid of? Uh, It sounds to some people, I think, more like a dysfunction than a sign of spiritual health. And yet the Bible, as we're going to see today, presents the fear of God as a friend. A friend who will do you all kinds of good if this friend is living in your soul. And so I invite you to open your Bible at Jeremiah and chapter 32, which was read for us. And we read there these words. Jeremiah 32 and verse 39, God says, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and for the good of their children after them. Now, notice what God is saying in this very important verse. God's own people are distinguished by the fact that they are the ones who fear him. 
and fearing him is for their good. And not only their good, it's for the good of generations that will follow. In other words, if the people of God were to lose the fear of God, there would be trouble in the generation that followed. That's what God is clearly saying. And that this fear of God is not limited to Old Testament times. He specifically says it is forever. It is forever. So as we're going to see today, there will never be a time on earth or even in heaven itself where the people of God do not fear him as we love him and love him as we fear him. I want to do everything that I can today to dispel the idea, if it may exist in any of our minds, to get rid of the idea that there is a God to be feared in the Old Testament and that there's a God to be loved in the New Testament and therefore the fear of God has nothing to do with a Christian believer. If you've thought that ever, if you think that now, I, I want to try and show you from the Bible an entirely different revelation with regards to the fear of God. By the way, if you were here last week, you may just spot the evolutionary view of the Bible that we spoke about last week in that thinking. See, the idea is, oh, well, in ancient primitive times, people had these crude ideas about a God who was to be feared, but now in these much more enlightened times, we have more sophisticated and better and inclusive ideas about a God who must be loved. That is entirely the evolutionary view of the Bible. It's a complete misunderstanding of what the Bible is. It's not the history of human views about God. It is God's word to us, and God never changes. So, so the idea that there's a God to be feared in the Old Testament, God to be loved in the New Testament, is a complete misunderstanding of what the Bible is and of what the Bible says. God never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is to be feared as he is loved, and he is to be loved as he is feared. So the Old Testament is full of the love of God. Read the book of Deuteronomy, and you'll find the unprovoked love of God that is sourced only in himself. Read the book of Hosea and you will find the intensity of the love of God where it is wounded and it's all played out in this amazing story of Hosea who will not stop loving his wife who is so unfaithful and that this is a revelation of the love of God. That's in the Old Testament. And when you come to the New Testament, you will find not only the love of God, but you will also find again and again the fear of God. Listen to this from Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. Fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Fear him. Who said that? Jesus. Who did he say it about? His father in heaven. Who did he say it to? His disciples. Peter, James, John, fear him. Who can destroy both body and soul in hell. The command to fear God, fear God, is a direct New Testament command. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 17, it's right there. Fear God. It's a New Testament command. The statement, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 31, is in the New Testament, and it's in a letter, Hebrews, that is addressed to Christian believers. Fearing God was the mark of the New Testament church at its best. Acts chapter 9 and verse 31. The church lived in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit and it multiplied. Notice how these two things are put together. The fear of the Lord, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The one experienced in conjunction with the other and not a bit of tension between them. They walked in the fear of the Lord when the church was at its spiritual height and God's blessing was being poured out in remarkable ways. This is what it was like among Christian believers. The fear of the Lord, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So very clearly we need to grasp this fear of the Lord that is spoken about in both testaments is commended to us as Christian believers. And in the scripture that is before us today, supremely we are told it is for our good and it will be for the good of our children after us. What then is this fear of the Lord? I want to suggest to you from the Bible that it is a cord of three strands. And the three strands are the splendor of God's glory the reality of God's judgment 
and the wonder of God's love. You've been listening to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith, and we'll come back to the message shortly. The message is called The Fear of God, and it's part of our series Soul Care, based today on Jeremiah chapter 32. If you tuned in late, or if you just simply want to go back and listen again, you can do that by coming online to our website, openthebible.org.uk. You'll also find the whole series to date on our website, and that's at openthebible.org.uk. You can also find Pastor Colin Smith's messages as a podcast, and you'll find that on your favourite podcast site by searching Open the Bible UK. There's also a link on our website to the podcast, if that's a more convenient way for you to keep up with Pastor Colin's teaching. At Open the Bible, we welcome contact with our listeners. If you've been blessed by Pastor Colin Smith's teaching and you'd like to reach out to us, there are several ways you can do that. You can write to us at Open the Bible, P.O. Box 1420, Cheltenham, GL50, 9PG. Or you can phone us on 0330 335 8089. If we're not available when you call, leave a message for us and we'll return your call. All of these contact details are available on our website, openthebible.org.uk. Back to the message now. Here's Colin. Hope you have the Bible open in front of you. Let's begin here, that the fear of God arises from a knowledge of the splendor of his glory. Now think about who God is, the God who just speaks and the moon and the stars and the planets come into existence and he upholds it all by the word of his power. I want you to see particularly in this chapter some glimpses of the glory of God in Jeremiah and chapter 32. If you look at the beginning of the chapter, You'll see it's titled, Jeremiah Buys a Field During the Siege. You read the story, I'll just give it to you in outline. Verse 2 tells us that Jerusalem was under siege. The Babylonian army was building up piles of earth against the city walls, getting ready to uh, walk up over the walls, attack the city, destroy it completely, and to destroy uh, the people. And uh, what happens to the economy of a country when that country is under siege, its capital city is surrounded. Well, very obviously, the economy goes into meltdown. Who in the world wants to buy land in a place that is about to be taken over by hostile and brutal enemies? What happens in that circumstance is that values collapse, trading stops, Commerce grinds to a complete and utter halt. The whole thing is gridlocked. And in that circumstance, Jeremiah did an extraordinary and a very public thing. He bought a piece of property. He's buying land in an economy where no one would see any value at all in buying a piece of land. Hold on to your assets. It, that's the, the, the best strategy. You might be able to find some way of escaping of the, of the Babylonians. But Jeremiah goes out and said, no, I'm going to spend money. I'm going to buy land. And why would he do such a thing? Verse 14 and 15, for thus says the Lord, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Now, that, of course, is exactly what happened. If you know the Old Testament story, it's a matter of history that some years after uh, the scene in the book of Jeremiah, that God, by his divine power, caused this world superpower, this world empire, this impregnable war machine of Babylon to collapse completely and utterly. That God, in his mercy, caused a pagan king by the name of Cyrus, a Persian, to have it in his heart, even though he did not know or honor God, to repatriate the people of God and to actively support and even sponsor their returning back to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. 
Who could have guessed that within a few years, God would utterly destroy and bring down the world superpower of the day? That God would bring back his people who had been so devastatingly scattered and that God would give to them in that land a thriving economy where things had been in meltdown just a few years before. Now you see what that is telling us? That God is sovereign even over the economies of nations. That's why he says in verse uh, 42, just as I have brought all this disaster upon this people, I will bring upon them all the good that I promised them. And verse 44, field shall be bought for money and deeds shall be signed and sealed and witnessed. I will restore their fortunes, declares the Lord. Here is the living God and he is sovereign over the fate of cities. And over the rise and the fall of nations. And he is sovereign over the growth and the decline of economies. And he is sovereign over the growth and decline of churches too. What else could it mean when the Son of God says in Revelation in chapter 1, I will remove the candlestick? What that means is that the life even of the people of God, even of the church, is in the hands of this living and in, of this sovereign God. And so it's not surprising that earlier in the book of Jeremiah, uh, the prophet speaks the word that God gives to him uh, in chapter 5 and verse 22. Do you not fear me, says the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? People who who do not fear the Lord have not seen his glory, who not only created the worlds, not only sustains them by his power, but controls the course of history, even the rising and the falling of nations, working out all things, including the disasters, as well as the blessings in the accomplishment of his own inscrutable and marvelous and glorious will. And when you begin to get a sense of God being that great and that glorious, you begin to get first strand of what it means to fear him. A cord of three strands. Number one, the splendor of God's glory ruling over the world and over history. Number two, the reality of God's judgment. Here's the second strand. And here I want to draw your attention to 2 Corinthians in chapter 5, where Paul the Apostle gives two statements right joined together. First, he says, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He's writing to Christians, and he says, now every one of us, every one of us, we're all going to stand one day before the judgment seat of Christ. You take that in, and then what he says in the very next verse is this. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we seek to persuade others. Here we live in a world of people who don't give weight to God, are not thinking about his judgment, probably don't believe in it. But God's people, who have seen something of the splendor of his glory and have come to know him, we do think about it. And it weighs with us. We know that we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we engage in the work of ministry. Now, I want you to think with me for a moment, as again I've tried to ponder this. It's good for us as Christians to ponder the day when we will stand before the Lord. And remember this, that he knows everything about you. He knows you better than you know yourself. There are many prayers in the Church of England liturgy that that I've found helpful over the years. And one of them is called a collect for purity. Very strange name. It's a short prayer and it goes like this. Almighty God, before whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Just think about that. 
Then the prayer says, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now you think about this. You are going to stand, I am going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and your heart is completely open to him. There's nothing that he doesn't know that's going on in your heart. And your desires are fully known to him. Even the conflicting desires, it's all known to him. And from him, no secret can be hid. You may carry lifelong secrets with regards to other people, even people who are close to you. But from God, no secret can be hid. He knows everything. He's perfect in his knowledge and infinite in his power. And we, you and I, we must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, simply to ponder that and to take it in is going to produce within your heart what the Bible describes as the fear of God. It arises not only from the knowledge of the splendor of his glory, but for taking in the reality of his judgment. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You've been listening to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith and our message today, The Fear of God. And we've been hearing how the fear of God is actually made up of three strands, the splendor of God's glory, the reality of his judgment, and next time in the broadcast, we'll look at the wonder of his love. So I hope you'll join us for that. Don't forget, if you ever miss one of the messages, or if you want to go back and listen again, you can do that by coming online to our website, openthebible.org.uk. You'll also find Pastor Colin Smith's messages as a podcast, and that may be a better way for you to keep up with his teaching. Those are available on all the main podcasting sites, or by following the link on our website. Also on our website and available as a podcast, you'll find Open the Bible Daily. That's a series of short two to three minute daily reflections based on Pastor Colin Smith's teaching and read in the UK by Sue McLeish. Many people find it's a brilliant way to start the day. Also on our website, you can find many of Pastor Colin Smith's sermons organised in four ways. By series, Colin preaches a whole series on a particular subject. By topic with reference to individual scripture, and by date. This means that it's really easy to home in on any of the subjects, topics, or scriptural references that you may be looking for. Go to openthebible.org.uk and click on the menu item, Sermons. You'll also find an online Bible study course entitled The Drive. This is a 30-session journey through the entire Bible, and it will take you deep into the valleys of the Old Testament, the peaks of the glory of Jesus, and the ups and downs of the Christian life. Again, that's The Drive, and you can find it under the menu item Resources on the Open the Bible website. That's openthebible.org.uk. Open the Bible depends on your generosity to keep Pastor Collins' teaching on this station and online. And as you set up a new monthly gift to the work of Open the Bible this month, we want to thank you by sending you a free copy of Chris Lungard's book, The Enemy Within, Straight Talk About the Power and Defeat of Sin. Colin, who would you say this book is for? Well, first is for anyone who is a Christian. By definition, a Christian is a person in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. And also by definition, a Christian is a person who is engaged in a serious battle against sin. The Apostle Paul says we've got to put to death the misdeeds of the body by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within you. And here's the thing. As you grow in the Christian life, you actually become more aware of the sins that you need to fight against in your life, not less aware of them. So there's an increasing sense of battle that a Christian experiences. And this book by Chris Lungard, The Enemy Within, is one of the most helpful books I have ever found on the subject of the battle of the Christian life. It is really encouraging. I've found it helpful, and I think that everyone who reads it will find it helpful too. Well, we want to send you a copy of this book, Chris Lingard, The Enemy Within, Straight Talk About the Power and Defeat of Sin. And it's our thank you gift to you if you're able to set up a new donation to the work of Open the Bible this month in the amount of £5 per month 
or more. Full details on our website, openthebible.org.uk. For Open the Bible and for Pastor Colin Smith, I'm David Pick, and I hope you'll be able to join us again next time on Open the Bible. What actually is the fear of God? Find out next time on Open the Bible.